twice, maybe a third time in our married life, she's seen me angry. And it's not pretty. <laughs> the first time, we had a dog, and he chewed up my Bible. <laughs> wow, I was right. <laughs> and I walked into the family room that morning, and that dog, my, they're like my Bible, the dog had chewed it up. And the dog's just sitting there fat and happy, glad to see me, you know. <laughs> and I, I picked that dog up by the hair on its back, you know how you pick it up by the skin, went over, kicked the back door open, and threw that dog about two-thirds of the way, about as far as here's that wall back yonder. The dog bounced, looked around, said, what did I do? <laughs> I turned around, looked at my wife. I, didn't, I, I, I couldn't speak for the rest of that day. I was so distraught. And I went and spent the rest of that day repairing that Bible. It's in my study, in, in my office in there now, repaired. And I, I, I repaired the thing. And after I cooled off, she came around and, you know, began to, Try to talk to me again. And it was, you ever hear that joke about the guy that, uh, well, I shouldn't tell you this. <laughs> Second Timothy. <laughs> she got the idea she didn't want to see me mad again. And she's done everything she can and been very successful at, 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 at keeping me happy. <laughs> well, the other side of it, I don't get real excited about things. You do get excited, but I'm just not a gregariously expressive person that way. And so... I was okay last night until I got behind it, and Charlotte said I rubbed it. <laughs> and it's just, it's just a piece of wood. It's 100 years old. I appreciate it. But it's, the, it's what it represents. Yeah. And it looks pretty good, too, doesn't it? Yeah. It looks nice on the, on, on the TV. So. But uh, the emotions of all that uh, you know, kind of get to you. And so it tells you when you get old, you, you get that way. 2 Timothy 3, we're in verse number 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So you need to live godly in Christ Jesus. You need to have the will to do it, but you have to understand that you're going to suffer persecution. The answer, verse 14, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. Don't change the doctrine. Don't leave the doctrine. Don't forsake the doctrine. If you come back to chapter 1 of 1 Timothy, Chapter 1, verse 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia. Now Paul, this, Paul writes this book after the end of the book of Acts. He's released from prison, where you last see him in the book of Acts. And he travels. You know that because when he says, I besought thee uh, to abide at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia. If you go back in Acts 19 and 20, when he was in Macedonia and in Ephesus, Timothy wasn't with him. None of this fits there. The only way this, this stuff would fit is if it took place after the book of Acts. And Paul, we know that Paul was released from prison. He had a little bit of a ministry, and then he's put back into prison ultimately again. During that time of release, he writes 1 Timothy, Titus, 2 Timothy. The, the idea that he's writing to Timothy at Ephesus, and he said, stay at Ephesus. There's some problems at Ephesus. Given in Acts 20, he goes to the, uh, meets the Ephesian elders. They're in good shape. He writes the book of Ephesians. These are great saints. But he warned them that after my departing, grievous wolves are going to enter in among the flock. And, uh, and, and there's the, they're going to come in from outside. And then people from within are going to try to draw away disciples after themselves. You're always going to face those two issues in your ministry. It doesn't make any difference where you go, who you are. What happens? There's always going to be a danger. Your ministry is going to be attacked in two ways. People, wolves, grievous wolves coming in from outside, bringing in false doctrine, and then people from within seeking to draw away disciples after themselves. It's easier to steal sheep than it is to produce new ones. Understand that? And if you just said, but we're not sheep, Brother Rick. You missed the point, didn't you? You might be a sheep stealer. No, I'm serious with you now. If you want people to listen to you, I can tell you the quickest way to get somebody to let you teach right division, and they'll believe you, get them saved. 
You be the one that introduces them to Christ. You, you win them to Christ. You teach them about salvation. You see them come to trust Christ as their Savior. And then you begin to try to teach them. You know what they'll do? They'll listen to you. How do I know? I've been doing it for five decades. I understand that. You go out here and try to knock heads with a bunch of relig- these hard-headed religious nuts out here. What happens? Nothing. But it's easier to go talk to those people than it is to go talk to a lost man. I'm not mad at you. I'm just telling you the truth. In your ministry, when you stand around and say, there's nobody who wants to believe this, it's because you're talking to the wrong people. If you talk to 10 people on the street, wherever you live, wherever you're doing, and ask them the crunch questions about if they, know, if, they could, if they could know for sure they could have eternal life and all the sins forgiven, if you ask 10 people, that six of them will say, I'd like to know. And if you tell those six, a couple of them will, will say, I'd like to trust Christ. You know how I know that? I've been doing it. Other people do it. God told me one time, he said, it's a numbers game. Brother Woody, he said, it's a numbers game. Just keep asking. Somebody said, well, they said no. He said, they hadn't told me no. <laughs> Take that attitude. Look at them. You say, I'm dudes out there. I don't want to sit. I go to the airport sometime. I see somebody. I say, man, a lot. And then I think, uh-oh, they might be a member of the body of Christ. That's a future member of the body of Christ. Let me go talk to them. I walked out of a restaurant not too long ago. Oh, maybe two years ago. And I said, it gets to be a long time. Time passes so fast. It was uh, uh, one of those Baker Squares. And there's four ugly-looking dudes sitting on the bench outside waiting on getting a seat. You know how they do that? And I walked by them. And I walked by them, and I'm, I'm thinking, uh, and then, then I, I thought, no, oh, no, no. I went over and said, hey, guys, we left a little food in there for you. You can have it. But let me ask you something. Has anybody ever loved you enough to ask you, if you were to fall off one of them bicycles because you were riding out there, where you'd spend eternity? And this big old guy, man, I mean, he, he was, I don't know how he sat on that Harley. <laughs> oh, white flag come up when he did. Big dude. He said, no. If you could know, would you like to know? Who wouldn't? But first I walked by him and didn't even pay attention. I walked by him and said, ugh. Glad I, my first thought was, I'm glad we got through eating before they. And I thought, wait a minute. Potential members of the body of Christ. We can have a hell's angels for Jesus now. <laughs> <laughs> no. If not you, who? Okay. But it takes some courage to do that. Continue. I'm impressed that Paul, when he says this, doesn't say, Timothy, in face of all the persecution you're going to face, I'm a, I'm, I, I gotta, we've got a time constraint. I'm going to not worry about chapter 1, verse 3, but let me go back and just read it to you. By the way, at Ephesus, by the time Paul wrote this, they had people who were decline, declining away. When you read 1 Timothy, remember, Paul's writing to Timothy. It's an already established church, been there for a long time, but now they've got people who've departed from the faith. That's why he gives the instructions that he does about here's how to say. When he writes Titus, Titus is preaching at Crete, and those churches haven't even gotten organized yet. They're new churches. So that's why there's, there's a little difference in the way that the approach, things are approached there, but the basic issue is the same. Verse 3, charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Don't change the doctrine. Neither give heed to fables. Don't start listening to the stories about how successful people are or endless genealogies. It doesn't make any difference who thinks the who is. Don't pay attention to personalities and homages. Listen, that pulpit doesn't mean something to me because of a man of, of a man I never met. It means something to me because of a ministry that I did meet. You understand that? That pulpit doesn't mean something to me because of some dead man that I never met. It means something to me because of a ministry that that brother had that I met in the people that he ministered to. 
You understand the difference in that? I'm, we're not eulogizing a person. We're honoring a ministry. This is not giving homage to personalities. It's giving thanks for a ministry that I've received, received blessing from. Now, the end of the commandment, you do what he said. Don't change the doctrine. Stick with the doctrine. Give yourself to godly edifying, which is in faith. Notice that when you give heed to, when you change the doctrine, give heed to fables and endless genealogy, it ministers questions. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That isn't what you want to do. You want to give yourself to godly edifying. Taking those form of sound words in Paul's epistles and building them up in the, in the inner man of yourself and those you minister to. The end of that, the result of that is charity. Out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. That's the essence of what the Christian life is all about. That's who, who we are. That's what he's talking about there in Philippians when he talks about living that a life that's worthy of the gospel. Striving together for the faith of the gospel, that fearless, uh, fearlessness and that unity, that, 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 that life of, of united, fearless striving for the truth. There it is. I'm struck when Paul faces all this persecution that he does. You read through Timothy, you see it over and over again. Be thou protector of the afflictions of the gospel. Over and over again, he talks about it, warns Timothy about it encourages him. He never says to Timothy, you know, Tim, you've been too intense. You need to lack, slack up a little bit. There's no point aggravating people. And maybe you'd be a little more diplomatic, a little more conciliatory. Paul was as diplomatic and conciliatory as anybody you ever met. It wasn't his diplomacy that was the problem. It was the message. You stand for the King James Bible. As a ministry across town, they called when we were in Chicago, they called us the shrine to King James in Chicago. I wrote the guy a card and said, Thank you. <laughs> People accuse you of all kinds of things. You can be as diplomatic as you want to be, they're still going to say that. The problem isn't in the diplomacy. The problem's in the message. And Paul doesn't say, well, just don't be so intense about it. Don't believe it, but don't tell people. We've got this thing goes around and says, I'll believe it and I'll stand for it. We just won't make it an issue. If you believe it and stand for it, it's going to be an issue. It is an issue. Now, we don't have Bible police people standing at the front door out there. Anybody comes in here, they're crazy enough to come in. We lock the door so they can't get out. <laughs> but what I know is that if you come sit here for six months and listen, you know what you'll do? You'll get you a King James Bible. Because the Bible you're using, if it isn't a King James, won't teach you like the King James taught you. Now, you know that. I know that. But standing for it, and if it gets you some criticism, it didn't be... I know you can be overboard about anything. I'm, be, be kind. Be, be, be gentle. Be apt to teach. Serve it God must not strive. But be gentle, patient, apt to teach. Be all of that. But understand, the truth is still going to be what it is. We stand up for Paul's distinctive ministry and message. And by the way, I wrote those five books on the board because five people asked me about them. Instead of just repeating them, you writing them down, there they are, Mr. Stams. Those are the five books of Mr. Stams that you have to have. The last communication I had from Pastor Stam years ago was he didn't want any of his books to appear on a table or in a room where I was. So if he's mad about he's in heaven now, he doesn't care. So I write it on the chalkboard. We have them in the bookstore down here. For years we had to buy them. Somebody else had to buy them for us to put them in our bookstore because they wouldn't sell them to, to, to me. I don't know how they get them in the bookstore now. we got nice people down there. They just write and get them. But um, those books, all the other books he wrote, can be you can, you can take them or leave them. I'm not telling you don't have them. I'm telling you that's the five you need. Those are like, that's the, 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 the essence of his ministry right there. We stand on his shoulders in those books. Okay? So have those books. 
You take things that differ, read that thing, start in chapter 2, and answer every question at the end of the, chapter, the chapters. When you get through, you can go back and read chapter 1, but forget it to start chapter 2 because chapter 1 will confuse you if you don't read the other ones. But you answer the, ten, the 20 questions to the end of each chapter, you'll understand more about your Bible than a guy that just graduated from seminary. He might know more, but you'll understand more. That's what Paul's distinctive ministry does. Okay? That's a commercial. <laughs> but you stand for Paul's distinctive ministry. You're going to cause commotion. Brother here last night, Brother Jerry, talking about uh, reprinting a book written about O'Hare. A guy named uh, Haggai wrote a book about O'Hareism back in the 40s, 30s and 40s. And O'Hare wrote an answer, the epistle according to Haggai. And it was his answer. And Jerry was telling me about it. There's a Baptist church over here on, on, on uh, Roselle Road, Sean, uh, Bethel Baptist Church back in the 90s, reprinted that book to refute us. They were mad at us. Some of the, one of their bus captains, Juan Perez, who's in our assembly here, he, he began to understand right division, reading things that differ there, came out, took it over to the pastor. That's church, 2,000 people. The guy's on the television. Oh, you, they're our little message of grace program. He's on right after us on the cable. He's got an hour. I've got 30 minutes. I don't know he's in the world. He, he's preaching about me. Just romping and stomping because he don't like that doctrine. They, they reprinted that book, put it in their bookstore about O'Hareism. So we printed the epistle according to Haggai. Went over there and put them on the windshields of their cars. Then they did. Then they had a reason to be mad at us. <laughs> The clarity of the gospel. When you stand against lordship salvation, that means you're going to stand against Billy Graham. You're going to stand against John MacArthur. You're going to stand against R.C. Sproul. You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the big boys. Paul didn't say, cut your sails. He said, stand for the truth. When you, you, when you stand for the grace life, the grace walk, grace as the, as the, as, as the life of the believer, you're putting there standing against everybody. Just like our forefathers kicked the religious idol of baptism in the Great Commission in Acts 2, we come along and, come and, and, and kick the, the, the law life of their legalistic prayer life, their least legalistic forgiveness life, and all the rest of it. And they get mad at us the same way the other guys got mad at them. There's a reason they drew a line, drew a circle, and drew us out. I understand that. And it's okay. Paul didn't say, back up. He said, keep going. He also didn't say, be more relevant. That's the big bugaboo today. What you need to be is relevant. Because when you're a ministry, if it isn't relevant, you're not going to get people in. You know any verse in the Bible in Paul's epistle that says, be relevant? Listen, if you are who you are, you're not relevant. You're countercultural. You understand that? We're producing people that are the... We're saving them out of the culture. And if what you're doing in your local church is trying to appeal to the culture or appeal, appeal to people through the culture, you're backwards. One of the ways you see this done the most is in music. There's a thing called contemporary Christian music. Now, that's a misnomer. Contemporary Christian music began in the 1980s. Anything began in the 80s is not currently contemporary. You're like Hillary Clinton. You're yesterday. You're like Jeb Bush. You're yesterday. Okay? But contemporary Christian music became popular through Calvary Chapel, Chuck Smith, and you can see it. You know it when you see it. It, it, it. You go into a church and the stage is a rock band. You know, whether it's a rock band with the drums on one side and the, and the singers on the other, or it's a jazz band, you know, with, 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 with the, the jazz ensemble. And listen, I like every kind of music there is. I'm, a, I'm, real, I'm not a musician, but I understand music. I can play the piano. I can play the organ. 
I taught myself to play the trumpet. I taught myself to play the banjo. I enjoy music of all kind. You go in my library, there's Boxcar Willie and, 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 and Hank Williams, and there's Mozart, and there's Chopin on the other side. And I've got, for me, rock music is, you know, it's more like the Bee Gees and the Beatles and not some of the stuff going on today. I'm not into the grunge stuff and the hard rock and all that stuff. All hard rock and the, the modern stuff is for is to give you an excuse to listen to the beat. I understand, I understand what music is. I understand the three, the three languages of music, the three things it takes to make music. Music is music. Words are words. Lyrics are the issue. But the music is what drives it. I understand those things, and I understand how you make it. I understand how you build it. I understand how they, how they produce contemporary Christian music. Contemporary Christian music, structurally, the way it's written is different than old music. But when people get mad at rock music, I, I like to remind people, you and I, that when we sing hymns in our books, that's called chorale music. You know who developed that? Martin Luther did. Chorale. You know what rock music is? A, if you take rock music in its original form, you know what the structure of rock music was? Did you know that you can play every rock song ever written with four chords? Actually with three. The fourth is thrown in. Google it. There's, 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 a, there's a group, there's four guys, a tree, three guys, a trio on YouTube, got the funniest thing you ever saw. And they, they have a, a whole hour where they sing every popular rock song been written in the last 30 years, and they play it to those three chords. Now, you don't know that. A mighty fortress is our God. We sang that last Sunday. It's only got like five, five different notes in it. But they're put together in such a way it's the hardest, it's the hardest hymn to play in the hymn book. But it's just still got just those, those five notes. But they're put together hard. But rock music, if you can play, if you can play three and maybe that fourth chord, you can play every song there is. But they all come from. Did you ever listen to Hank Williams? You know, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun, da -dun. it's all comes. It all come out of church music. That's where these guys came from. Now it's been changed. So I'm, I, I got nothing against any kind of style of music, but I understand what's what's happened. And you go into a church and you, 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 you see that stuff up there. That con they said, we're being contemporary. What are you? We're trying to be relevant to the culture. That isn't what you're called to do. You know who the newsboys are? That's one of the most popular Christian bands in the last 30 years. I co-founded one of the most popular Christian rock bands ever, and I'm now an atheist. One of the four guys that started the Newsboys, 1980, started in Australia. Here's his story. George writes this. He says, I always felt uncomfortable with the strict rules imposed by Christianity. I was all, I, all I wanted to do was create and play rock and roll. And yet most of the attention I received was focused on how well I maintained the impossible standards of religion. I wanted my life to be measured by my music, not by my ability to resist temptation. By, by 2007, I renounced Christianity once and for all and declared myself an atheist. The Christian music scene is popular, populated by many people who act as though they have a direct hotline to God who supply, supplies them with answers to the universe. This seems to be more ego and narcissism among uh, Christian musicians than their secular counterparts. Recently, the newsboys were featured in a movie, the movie God's Not Dead. The movie demonstrated the pervasive Christian attitude of Christians. They demonize everyone, uh, everyone else while giving a pass to their own popular brand of Christianity, making themselves look like fluffy white angels with perfect synchronized life. The truth is that someone who knows from someone who knows from within, uh, from from what went on. Uh, then and what goes on now, the newsboys aren't as holy as they profess. Instead of wearing their, the, a mask of righteousness, they should acknowledge that they're struggling as much as everyone else. You see, the people you're lionizing, that's them. You think these guys are making you relevant, and that's them. You want to know why they, why they weaken down music, why they do what they do? Now, here's, here's another David Emery Price, I don't know if you know who he is. He's another Christian rock star. I've played guitar and band since my early teens, and although I never experienced the level of success that, uh, that George did, that um, yeah, George did, uh, as a son of a pastor, I too struggled with the band identity and by proxy my own. We were a Christian band, played at churches, youth groups, lock-ins, 
and every other Christian function. I remember saying a lot of spiritual things from the stage, but the reality was one band member was on drugs, another was drinking a lot, and I was terrified that my girlfriend was pregnant. And you think that's who you ought to let tell you how to reach the world. That's what being relevant gets you. Paul doesn't say you need to be relevant to reach the world. Now you, I'm, I'm, gonna tell you, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you that's what you're buying into when you do it. And when someone walks in and they say, oh, we're at a rock venue. These guys are cool. You're not where Paul is. And he said, well, what do you do at your church? We sing pretty lousy, just like you do at your church. Okay, I understand that. I'm talking about something bigger than that. You follow me? I'm not mad at your music. I'm telling you that God called us to be countercultural, not relevant. The way you are counterculture, the way you become relevant is you speak truth because it's always relevant. It doesn't change with the tide. You preach eternal truth. Use whatever venue you want to preach it in, but preach eternal truth. The reason these guys write songs that don't represent the truth in its fullness or even at a shallow point is that in their focus? Those two guys write the songs you're singing when you sing contemporary Christian music. Somebody last night was in my office and they were talking about being in the doghouse. You ever hear the Hank Williams song? She told me once, she told me twice, but I don't take no one's advice. Move it on over, cold dog, because the hot dog's moving in. <laughs> <laughs> Hank Williams sung those songs because he was a drunkard. And he had a mean wife. And they fought like cats and dogs. I used to live about a half a mile from where his grave is in Montgomery, Alabama. And those things were born out of that. They weren't born out of godliness. You know what country music is? It's beer drinking, wife swapping music. It's born out of that. I'm not mad at it. I'm just telling you, you need to understand when you do ministry, that isn't where your ministry comes from. It comes from the truth of God's Word. And you have to be careful about what you do because people are watching. And people are going to use you as a standard. Now, if you want to have the courage that you need to have, look, look with me. So you're in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I think that the path to courage is exemplified in this passage. I tell myself all the time, you got 2 Timothy 4? Hold that and come back to Matthew chapter 11. I tell myself... You ever talk to yourself? <laughs> Self? I need to talk to you. <laughs> there, there are certain things that I, I talk to myself about. My dad used to say I like to talk to myself every now and then because I like to have an intelligent conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things I've learned is you need to be careful about Knowing too much and believing too little. We know a lot. Listen, we know things that this brother didn't know because we stand on his shoulders. And sometimes we look down and say we're standing on his shoulders and we look down at him instead of appreciate how high he lifted us to start with. He spent his whole life learning these truths and establishing them and defending them. I learned them six months after I was saved. I'd read every one of those books. I digested it, studied my Bible in light of it, and was teaching the Bible, not these books, but the Bible, in light of what I learned. Within a year of the time I was saved. He, I took 
40 years of his life in ministry and assimilated it and began to teach it. He was never mad at me a day of my life because I did, I did in a year, learned in a year what took him 40 years to learn. He was glad that somebody could take it and go with it. You understand? I hope you do. But you've got to be careful about knowing too much and believing too little of what you know. Matthew chapter 11, there's a, there's a, there, there's a fascinating little, little vignette about this. Verse number 20, Matthew eleven twenty. 20. Then, then he, that's Jesus, up, uh, began he to upbraid the, the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto you, Chorazan. Woe unto you, Beth Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which had been done in you had been done in Tyre and Zidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. If they knew what you knew, they'd have got right. You knew all this. It's his hometown. I did all these miracles. You saw it all. You knew far more, but you didn't believe any of it. You remember what he says in Corinth? Paul says, knowledge puffs up, charity edifies. You can know something, big amount. But if it doesn't transfer into your inner man as life, you don't believe enough. When you do the work of the ministry, you need to remember the last verse in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 where he talks about doing the work of faith with power. There are times you're going to need to step out and just take the dare of faith to believe what God says is true no matter what it looks like around you. It isn't going to matter how much you know, then it's going to matter what you believe. The philosophy of your ministry, the way you approach the thinking, what you believe the ministry is about, that's, that's the path to real courage. Second Timothy 4. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, Tom talked to you last night about the judgment seat of Christ. We live, guys, we work in light of the fact that our ministry is going to be reviewed and it's accountable to our Savior. I'm not accountable to you first. I'm accountable to Him. I'm not accountable to you ultimately. I'm accountable to Him. Now, we've got people that we're accountable to in life to get us through, but the ultimate accountability is to the one that called us. I don't believe you have spiritual gifts. But I think, I know sometimes some of us get a better, a better grip on the calling that God has given to us as members of the body of Christ than others. And when Paul says, if any man desire the work, the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A lot of folks want the office. I'm the pastor. They don't want the work. When you see the work involved, then the office isn't quite as attractive. Verse 2, preach the word. I like that. Well, if, you, if you're going to preach the word, you've got to have the word. Jeremiah 23 says, He that hath my word, let him proclaim it. You've got to have it. If you don't have it, keep your mouth shut and go find it. If you can't hold a book in your hand that you can say about it, what God says about His word, that it's perfect, that it's complete, that it's pure, that it's right. If you've got to stand up in front of people and say, Well, a better, a better one would be this way. You need to keep your trap shut, stay home, and study till you've got one that's right. I'm trying to be clear because I don't have much time. <laughs> but the task with that word, he doesn't say pack the word, carry it around, show it off, write notes in it. He said, preach it. Proclaim it. 
Get it out. Don't just hold on to it. Don't just put it under your arm and walk around with it. Don't just wave it at somebody. Preach it. Proclaim it. Be instant, in season, and out of season. Be faithful. It's a never-ending task. In season, out of season. For a hundred years ago, when this pulpit was placed in the North Shore Church building, it was in season to preach the Word. Today, it's out of season. I had a bunch of emails and messages last night where there were people watching on, on the video talking about how nice the pulpit looked. I write people back and said, it's home. But it's home because we proclaim the message that it was put in that pulpit to proclaim. And it doesn't make any difference if it's in season or out of season. It's out of season for you. Listen, I got news for you. Your ministry is, is going to be during an era when it's out of season. You can long for the old days all you want. They aren't here. They aren't coming back anytime soon. What are you supposed to do? Preach the Word. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. Oh, you could have left that out, Paul. The tone of your preaching... Reprove, rebuke, exhort. I say to you in the P and D class: Good preaching demands a verdict. It's meant to change your life. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. It's meant to get into your life. This, the scriptures for doctrine, reproof, correction. We love the doctrine, but the doctrine is for for reproof. Is to say that's not right. Here's how to fix it. And when you take what's not right and you fix it, you have righteousness. That's what it's about. You need to love the reproof and correction as much as you love the doctrine. Oh, yeah. If it excites you to know that the one baptism today is by the Spirit, that the body of Christ began with Paul and that we don't follow the commission in Matthew 28, but we follow Paul's commission. If that excites you and gets your blood stirred up, that Romans to finally even is your doctrine, it ought to get your excitement stirred up to know that you ought to be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. That ought to excite you just as much. There are some of you dudes sitting right here, if you went home and treated your spouse with the excitement to be kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving that you treat some preacher about baptism and Pentecost, your life would be changed. Amen. Brother Rick, what, reprove, rebuke, exhort. It's meant to change your life, folks. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall teep to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. You know what you do then? You don't compromise. They don't want it. Tough apples. You're not called irrelevance. You're called to proclaim the truth. You're called to faithfulness in proclaiming what they need. And you are relevant when you preach eternal truth. The irrelevance is the culture. Get that nailed in your head. Don't look to the culture for the answer. Look to the truth and take the truth and proclaim it to the culture. I tell our guys here, I would love to be here 30 years from now. I won't be, but I'd love to be. But I'm trying to teach people in our church, you guys need to learn how to think differently than the way we always thought. Because ministry is going to look different. And the shape of the ministry, the skin of the ministry, the function of the ministry, the form of the ministry, rather, has to follow the function. And maybe the form changes. I don't know. I, it will. It already is. But the function doesn't. But watch thou in all things. <laughs> That's good, isn't it? Understand your priorities. Stick with them. 
Be watchful. Pay attention. I was in a church in Ohio one time, and a deacon came to me, and he said, Brother Rick, what do you think about a church where I used to go, and I got called in front of the pastor and the deacon board because my wife was wearing pants? And I said, well, what was the, what was the idea? He said, well, they had a rule. You couldn't wear pants to church. But my wife wore them around the house, and one of the deacons was down there looking at watching one day, and she went out and hung up clothes in the backyard, and I said, no, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. how did he see that? He said, well, he was down there watching her. <laughs> and I said, how long did you spend in jail after you hit him in the head with a club? <laughs> he said, I didn't. I said, well, why didn't you? <laughs> That's not what he's talking about, watching. I mean, I'm not spying on one another. He's talking about watching your ministry, keeping it continuing in the things that are there. I'm not talking about having dominion over people. Amen. Endure affliction. Endure hardness. Do the work of an evangelist. By the way, that's hard work. It's a whole lot easier to steal sheep than it is to go out and make new converts. You need to get in the game. If you can look back... This is the end of April. If you can look back to January and you can't find in your memory somewhere where you have sat down and shared the gospel with a lost person on purpose, on intentionally, if I were you, I'd go home and think about hanging up my cleats. Or maybe I'd go home and think about getting my cleats out of the closet because that's where they are. You need to get in the game. And the game's not sitting around stealing somebody else's sheep, telling everybody else what to do. The game is preach the Word. And what God's doing today first is seeing people get saved. And then those saved people come to the knowledge of the truth. You need to spend some time in your life, and thus it will come into your ministry to intentionally do the work of an evangelist. And the reason Paul had to tell Timothy that is because it's easy to let that slip because you get involved in all these other things. Make full proof of thy ministry. Don't quit. You and I have been called to radical, risk-taking, courageous living. Get on with it. I take that passage, I take that passage at least once a week. I do. And I examine myself. Maybe that's not the way to say it. I let that passage examine me. I told you I read that book every year. I did it for years. I don't do it so much now, but I did it for years. Because when I was young, I knew the danger of being seduced. Now that I'm older and busier, I know that I need to take a passage like that and let it examine because my priorities can get filled up in wrong places. We're going to take a break. We're going to take... 